Hello, friends. As we all know, the ocean is full of fish and other living creatures. And according to scientists, it will be able to feed humanity for hundreds, if not thousands of years. However, adventure novels about courageous travelers crossing seas and oceans and even sailing around the world tell us how sailors were often forced to starve in the open sea, how they suffered from scurvy and even died of hunger. So what's the mystery here? There are several reasons, actually, and they aren't that simple. The first reason is that sailors were afraid to eat fish. Famous seafarers such as Christopher Columbus and Ferdinand Magellan spent months sailing the seas, but surprisingly, they didn't eat sea fish. The first warning sign dates back to the year 650. The Chinese doctor Chen Sang Shi recorded a fatal outcome caused by the yellowtail fish. And by the 16th century, there was already a large-scale study of potentially dangerous fish. The author was the chronicle of the Spanish court, Pietro Martire de Angeri. He analyzed the testimonies of sailors who sailed with Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, Hernán Cortés, and Ferdinand Magellan in the Caribbean and other warm seas. The consumption of fish caught in the open sea caused various gastroenterological and neurological disorders that could occur one to six hours after the meal. Even if the person ate small portions, they could experience stomach ache, headache, dizziness, vomiting, diarrhea, numbness or tingling sensations, and in worse cases, muscle paralysis, coma, and often even death. The second bosun of the British ship Bounty, James Morrison, kept a detailed diary where he said, Among the fish there is a kind of conger eel of a brownish color with a green border around the fins from head to tail. They are caught about the reefs and are different sizes from one to six feet long. These fish are of a poisonous nature to some, and if eaten, gives the most excruciating pain, while others who eat it feel no effects, nor do the natives know who will be affected by it till they have eaten it. Indeed, neither the sailors nor the locals could determine which fish would be dangerous to their health because it wasn't an altogether inedible kind, but rather a well-known delicacy that could turn into an enemy. Thus, it was easiest not to eat it at all. Those who were willing to take the risk first put a silver coin on the fish. If it turned black, then the fish was considered bad. Some tried another method. They left some of the fish in an open area and waited to see if flies would land on it. If they did, the fish could be eaten, but if even insects avoided it, then people chose to do the same. But how come fresh fish could become unfit for consumption? There was no answer until the middle of the 20th century. In the 18th and 19th centuries, many cases of poisonings with similar symptoms were recorded in Cuba. The doctor suggested that the problem was caused by shellfish, cigua in Spanish, and so they called the disease ciguatera. And in 1961, scientists at the University of Hawaii were finally able to identify the poison. Continuing the tradition of Cuban researchers, they named it ciguatoxin. Although the vast majority of ciguatera outbreaks occur along the coasts of the South Pacific and Caribbean, the toxin is found in the tissues of approximately 400 species of fish that are found in the seas between the latitudes of 35 degrees north and 34 degrees south. All these fish live in reefs at depths of no more than 60 meters. The source is unicellular algae of the species Gambiardiscus toxicus, living in warm waters around coral reefs. Small fish feed on them and then get eaten by larger fish and thus may eventually end up in the human body. Moreover, the toxin is harmless to the fish, while humans can't develop immunity for it and an antidote hasn't been found yet. But poisonous fish wasn't the only reason sailors didn't eat it. Fishing interfered with the assigned combat missions. To get enough fish to feed sailors on a warship or a merchant ship, they would need to fish on an industrial scale. They'd need to track down a shoal of fish, place the nets, and even if the catch was impressive, it would still take a lot of time to gut all the fish. Moreover, it would require a lot of precious fresh water. 
the sailboat could develop a speed of 4 knots and even more in favorable weather conditions. That is, it could sail a distance of about 700 miles in a week, easily reaching its destination. It simply didn't make sense to stop and waste time fishing given these conditions. However, during waiting time or calm seas, they did try to fish. It turns out that not all of the sea is teeming with life. There are large swaths of the ocean that are oligotrophic, which means that they don't contain enough nutrients to support sufficient biomass. The biggest of these areas are located in the center of the subtropical gyres, in the region of 30 to 40 degrees north and south latitude. That's because at these latitudes, winds shift from westerly winds blowing east to trade winds blowing west. Simply put, this means that these areas are almost completely calm. If you've ever heard of the Atlantic Ocean trade routes between Africa and North America, you probably know about the horse latitudes, where ships drifted with the current for a long time due to weak winds, so sailors were often forced to eat their horses because of the shortage of supplies. The key to understanding the lack of marine life is also associated with winds. In much of the ocean, biologically available nitrogen and phosphorus come from relatively deep layers. The two main mechanisms by which nitrogen and phosphorus become available in sunlit areas is intense mixing caused by severe winter storms or tropical cyclones. Therefore, with the almost complete absence of wind over a large area of the ocean, the level of nutrients is extremely low. Because of this, photoplankton hardly grow. Thus, an extremely small amount of photoplankton means that an extremely small number of organisms can feed on it. And so the chain goes on until it gets to the extremely small number of fish for humans to catch. If we take a look at Magellan's circumnavigation map, we can see that they spent a lot of time passing through the center of the South Pacific subtropical gyre, an area of almost zero photoplankton production. Taking this into account, we can now conclude that the weak winds had a double effect here. The ship sailed in an area where almost complete calm reigned, so the sailors had time to fish, but there was very little marine life, so they couldn't catch any fish. Thus, they were trapped in the heart of the ocean desert. And that's all for today, friends. Share your thoughts on today's episode in the comments. Don't forget to like the video and share it with your friends. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.